Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you all here on this freezing cold October day. Um, welcome, my name is Barbara Fry, and I'm the director of the Human Rights Program, which is uh, based in the Institute for Global Studies in CLA. Um, the Human Rights Program is an interdisciplinary hub of research, teaching, and engagement that seeks to mobilize knowledge to advance human rights. Um, we um, uh, are here today to celebrate as part of the 150th anniversary of CLA. So I'm very excited to have this panel on uh, human rights, memory, and post-coloniality. It's, it's sort of a quintessential CLA approach to uh, human rights, which is what one of the things that really makes us stand out as a human rights university. We like to uh, sometimes uh, call ourselves that because we have a really substantial number of faculty uh, and degree programs uh, who, that are focused on human rights and, um, and therefore have gained a bit of an international reputation for our work. The Human Rights Program supports several degree programs. Uh, we have an undergraduate concentration in human rights as part of the Global Studies degree. We have since 2001 graduated 150 or so human rights minors who are graduate students from PhD and master students from across the university who choose to uh, also minor in human rights. And um, just our most recent degree uh, was launched three years ago and it's a Masters of Human Rights program which is a joint degree between the College of Liberal Arts and the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Uh, it's a two-year professional degree um, unique in the country, there are very, very few master's programs in human rights, and, but because of the, the strength of the faculty in those two units, um, we felt that, um, and the ability to take advantage of classes across the university, we felt like it was the right time and the right place. So we're pleased that this year we have our third cohort of uh, human rights students. We graduated our first cohort in in May, and now we have 13 first-year <laughs> students and 13 second-year students in that master's program. Um, in addition to degree programs, we, uh, we support research. Um, we're very pleased we've had CLA support in um, gaining uh, compact funds from the provost's office which uh, support a program called the Human Rights Initiative, which is an annual um, awards uh, program for research in human rights and uh, where faculty can receive between ten and fifty thousand dollars of research funds. We've had some of the, Patrick has uh, been awarded this grant and, and uh, several of our human rights faculty have received this grant. Um, it's really allowed us to to deepen the um, new approaches to human rights and again um, uh, increase our reputation internationally. And if faculty are interested in that and you have to be affiliated or partner with someone in CLA or the Humphrey School and the deadline is next Wednesday, but uh, see me if you are concerned. Um, in addition to the Human Rights Initiative funds, we received a Grand Challenges grant uh, in uh, association with our partner center in the law school, the Human Rights Center, to uh, in 2016 to 18 to run what we call the Human Rights Lab, which is an interdisciplinary collaborative uh, workshopping process for um, uh, emerging faculty projects that also sum support summer research assistants uh, who work in the field in relation to the faculty projects. We funded 12 such projects and some of you were at, we had a symposium last week for two days where faculty showcased the results of their work which um, really generated a, an exciting, not only exciting amount of research but um, really important uh, networking and collaborations with human rights activists um, organizations um, and uh, institutions in the field. So um, finally, I'm just going to make a shameless plug for an upcoming program that we're sponsoring. We have an annual lecture in human rights called the Scallon 
that's the Scallon Lecture, funded generously by the Scallon family. And um, we, it's the Principled Voices Lecture Series. And this year on October 29th, uh, we will be uh, discussing, featuring Protecting the Press in Myanmar or Burma. And we have a panel of um, three journalists. Um, uh, one is the person at the Committee to Protect Journalists who uh, handles the Myanmar case. The other is a journalist from Myanmar who is currently doing a, a master's at Harvard um, who was uh, kind of had to leave the country because of the nature of her journalism. And the third is our own uh, Theory Thu who is um, one of our uh, master student, a second year master student here who is m more of a a fixer for journalists and human rights organizations, but um, she um, has really getting a high high profile for her expertise on human rights in, in Burma in general. So this will be at the lovely space at the Regis Art Center that has all of your photos uh, from CLA hanging around. So please uh, join us for that. We'll send a lot around on email, but there's some paper paper invitations there. Okay, done with the shameless plug. Um, on to the program. Um, so today, as you know, our theme is memory, human rights, and post-coloniality. The speakers um, are going to um, bring us through um, e these issues, each situated in their own specific context with a heavy focus on um, memory and representation of atrocities associated with uh, colonial uh, period. So the questions that we, we like to raise in this regard, who tells the story, who has the right to tell the story, um, competing truth claims about, about history and how those are um, filtered into present relations. So we're delighted to feature three um, of our outstanding faculty from different units. And I'm going to introduce them as they speak. Um, our three faculty members are Ana Paula Ferreira from Portuguese Studies, um, uh, Rahmi Dia Larasati from, uh, from Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies, and Patrick McNamara from History. I'll introduce them each as they come up, and they'll give their presentation. And then maybe we could take one or two questions for their presentation. Um, and then afterwards, we'll all uh, get together at the panel and have a discussion. Okay, okay. So Ana Paula Ferreira, uh, well known to us all for her work across the college as our associate dean, but also, of course, professor of Portuguese studies. She holds an MA in Hispanic literatures and a PhD in Luso-Brazilian literature with a comparative emphasis on the novel of social commitment. She has published articles, books, and edited collections of essays on women writers, feminisms, race, and late empire. Her latest book, Women Writing the Portuguese Empire, is forthcoming by Liverpool University Press. Her talk here today is part of a planned volume of essays tentatively titled, Heretically Speaking, Race, Memory, and the Postcolonial in Portuguese. Ana Paula. So can I have, <clears throat> can I have my, okay, there we go. Um, I'm going to um, proceed um, essentially uh, with three uh, sections. In the first section of my talk, um, I'm going to show several slides just to bring you up to date on the historical background that you need to know in order to understand uh, the rest. Then um, I speak about, um, in more theoretical terms, uh, literature as um, having to confront the theme of war and do the work of mourning in those situations uh, when governments have not confronted um, the atrocities of civil wars. On the contrary, they have uh, silenced them. Um, then I go on to a section of my talk that is supposed to show what a professor of literature 
that still believes in closed reading um, can do um, uh, when reading a text. That is the type of information that um, calls out for closed reading with an eye for historical understanding as well as the, that historical understanding that happens at the intimate, personal level. Um, finally, the last section of my talk, and I, and I won't even go into it if we don't have time, um, is, is really an argument with my field. You have probably heard about this Lusophone, this and that. My, the program in my department was called by a previous professor Lusophone Studies, and as you will uh, glean, um, I, have, I, I, I have a critical um, position in regard to the uh, transparent use of that uh, label. Um, so I'll go to, I'll, I'll start. This past September 26, um, marking the first anniversary of João Lourenço's presidency, um, Human Rights Watch called for the new leader of Angola to investigate past right abuses and promote justice. Formerly the Minister of Defense in the long reigning popular movement for the liberation of Angola, better known by the acronym MPLA, Lorenzo succeeded by general election President José Eduardo dos Santos, who had been in power since 1979. His repressive corrupt regime followed that of Agostinho Neto, leader of MPLA, since 1962, and Angola's first president following independence from Portugal on November 11, 1975. Two other parties fought for uh, independence from Portugal, and um, they were FNLA, National Front of Liberation of Angola, and UNITA, National Union for the Liberation of Angola. United, they were combined into UNITA, led by Jonas Savimbi, um, and they immediately took arms against the unilateral taken of power by MPLA um, on uh, November 11, 1975. The civil war that ensued was to last until the death of Jonas Savimbi in February 2002. And by the way, uh, Jonas Savimbi still hasn't had a dignified burial um, in Angola or elsewhere. According to Freedom House, the Civil War created a mass humanitarian crisis ruining the country's infrastructure, claiming an estimated one million lives, displacing over one half million people, and disabling around 80,000 by innumerable landmines whose removal is still in process. Although President João Lourenço has started to intervene in financial corruption involving the former president and especially his daughter, businesswoman Isabel dos Santos, considered the richest woman in Africa, it is doubtful whether the righting of past wrongs will depend upon institutional mechanisms of truth-seeking. Such mechanisms would likely disrupt the peace of a government of unity obtained through internationally mediated negotiations between formerly belligerent parties. Besides, it is not, up, it is not to the interests of João Lourenço or Angolan ec economy now trying to recuperate from the slump due to, to from the slump due to fall in oil prices, to open up to scrutiny the government's um, uh, unity uh, set by José Eduardo dos Santos in 2002. And the reason I put unity uh, between quotes is because UNITA has never had equal footing um, in the government of Angola. Um, Peace in Angola, as political anthropologist John Schubert observes, and I quote, equals infrastructure reconstruction, there being no need, according to the opinion imposed by the government, 
for reconciliation or any other form of institutionalized dealing with the past. Um, and the, his research uh, went up to 2015. Things haven't changed as, bad, as far as this is concerned. While it is, and I quote again, um, while it is on the shoulders of the living that the burden of justice must continue to rest, to quote Wolf Suinka, the first African to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1986, the Muse of Forgiveness, I'm, I'm evoking the title of a very important book that he published in 1999. The Muse of Forgiveness must not uh, keep from public memory the violence, crimes, and human pain perpetrated by the two sides of the Angolan War. Not that writers in Angola have condoned the repressive, violent dictatorship of the M MPLA government. Most have found ways, even in the repressive dictatorship, have found ways to denounce it, especially through irony and humor. But they have not taken up the task, arguably um, the very important memory task, of questioning the dominant belief that UNITA rebels alone were responsible for the inhuman ha acts of violence that decimated Angola between 1975 and 2002. José Eduardo Agualuza has um, done so, moved by disappointment and anger, that one of, one of his characters expresses this disappointment by exclaiming, it wasn't for this that we fought for independence, comrade. Not for Angolans to kill each other as rabid dogs. So the second part of my talk, or the main part of my talk, literature must confront the theme of war and do the work of mourning. Born in Angola in 1960 to Portuguese parents, this is Agualuza and the book that I'll be talking about. Um, Agualuza was 15 and he, and he is called by his last name, although calling people by last name is not so typical um, in Portuguese speaking cultures. Um, so he was 15 when in 1975, independence was declared uh, and between 500,000 and 1 million colonials their descendants and Angolans with no family ties in Portugal fled the country, fearful of the violence and unrest. As an adult working as a journalist in the late 1980s, um, he lived in Angola for a few years during the Civil War, but in the relatively peaceful capital city of Luanda. His birthplace in the province of Wambu um, was one of the areas most decimated by the Civil War, um, this area. I hope I don't, yeah. One can surmise that Agualuza, as the son of returned colonials, they're called retornados, was formed as an adult with the consciousness of loss of homeland, more specifically, the loss of the ideal of the democratic sovereign country dreamt by those involved directly and indirectly in the 13-year war for independence from Portugal, a war that lasted from 1961 to 1974. Um, this was the case with May. Sorry. Um, his return to Angola is likely to have intensified that sense of loss as he gained direct knowledge of the act of violence, destruction, and genocide, not simply perpetrated by UNITAS, continued guerrilla warfare, but by the MPLA government itself, namely against its own dissenting members. This was the case with the May 27, 1977 attempted coup, resulting in a massacre over which complete silence was imposed. And it was not until 2014 that a book by British historian Laura Poisson, in name of the people, The Forgotten Massacre, Angola's Forgotten Massacre, that um, the history of the massacre went out um, to the public eye. 
Many years later, after earning much success as a post-colonial writer living not in Angola, but in Brazil, Agualusa would imaginatively reconstruct the tragic May 27 revolt in the award-winning novel, Teoria Geral do Esquecimento, translated by Daniel Han as a general theory of oblivion. I should note that this book has been given many awards, uh, the latest, um, the Dublin Literary uh, Award um, of uh, FT Sum of um, Heroes. Um, but I'll get, uh, you'll know why I'm pointing that out at the end. So, um, addressing a group of international um, academics gathered in 2013, that is the year of publication of the book, for a collaborative research project on memory, Agualusa stated that literature has the obligation to confront the theme of war, in this case the Civil War, and the violence that it unleashed. He noted that in the absence of truth commissions or other public outlets for people to deal with the historical trauma that haunts them, literature needs to put memory to work, trabalhar a memoria, and mourn the dead. Memory and mourning turn out to be then collective processes, processes even if performed individually in discrete acts of writing and reading. Agualuza's position, arguably in view of marketing his book, resonates with current theoretical insights regarding the role of the arts and literature in particular in post-conflict government. Um, and I have a number of, of uh, references to that, um, uh, to that theoretical literature. I, I'll be brief and just um, summarize. Imaginative truth-telling, or what Paul Greedy understands as novel truths, in contrast with the Human Rights Report, for example, has the merit of in inscribing the memories that institutions obliterate and of modeling acts of memory, both personal and collective, that speak to publics beyond the limits of place and time in which the art originated or to which it refers. Indeed, as several scholars have pointed out, in state initiatives of truth and reconciliation, the performative, theater-like quality of public confessions and the literary qualities of the languages of recall, testimony, and witnessing seem to have had the most productive, constructive effects in cultural production. Such effects may yet, uh, may yet have to perform the miracle of reconciliation to recall poet Adam Small's much quoted phrase. But the attributes of literariness are arguably what continue to enable the deliberate artistic acts of memory. Um, and they function to invite not only potential communities of memory, but continuing the work of mourning or doing the work of mourning that was never done in the original sites of the atrocities. Following Roman Jakobsen, uh, and this is a name that is really old fashioned, but um, some of us of my age still remember how important he was to remember um, uh, uh, the formalists back then. Um, that language of uh, literary language had a special quality. I have in mind. Um, a language that foregrounds its own artistic quality, uh, that is, its stylistic and narrative strategies, thus defamiliarizing objects, events, etc., that have become cultural common sense. This invites modifications of personal acquired meanings. Literariness, then, in schematic terms, is just the opposite of journalistic, or should be just the opposite of journalistic or scientific denotative language, and it is what distinguishes the artistic use of language from other types of writing. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not engaging critically with this definition. I'm using the definition as, an, as a, a methodological guide for um, what follows. So I'll briefly illustrate how this particular novel defamiliarizes de de the commonplaces nationally and internationally associated with the belligerent sides of the Angolan Civil War 
inviting historical, economic, and personal understandings of the, of the war under the shimmering, uncertain light of poetic, light, of poetic language. Um, now comes the, the more literary uh, analysis. Uh, ludic memory, repetition, variation, deconstruction. Agualuza flaunts the act of writing as a responsibility to pass on stories received, challenging both epistemologically and ethically the notion that one would have to have lived the disaster in order to produce testimonial truth or be a credible witness. In the introduction to the novel, uh, he or his fictional I announces that the novel is inspired in the writings of someone the name Ludovica Fernandez Mano, who had died in a clinic in Luanda in 2010 when she was 85 years old. 20 notebooks of her diaries would have been given to him by someone with the hybrid African-Portuguese name, um, Savalu Estevão Capitango, referring to their author by the nickname Ludo, Ludo. Hence, uh, memory as a ludic activity. A woman who had enclosed herself for close to 30 years in what once had been a luxury apartment in the center of Luanda. Luanda is the capital city of Angola. The reader is informed, furthermore, that he also had access to her later writings, as well as to numerous photographs of the apartment's walls, covered with the writings and drawings in charcoal. At the end of the foreword, under acknowledgments and bibliography, Agualusa declares that he wrote the story of the Portuguese woman for a screenplay, invited by filmmaker Jorge Antonio. The screenplay uh, doesn't exist. He never went on, uh, never was able to have the funding uh, to do the screenplay. And I don't know if there were other contingencies. And he lists two other writers in whose work he was inspired, her, whose poems he ordered to suit his book's protagonist, a writer herself, Ludo. Those writers are Brazilian. He also acknowledges several readers, two of his Portuguese journalist colleagues, both women, and especially his parents. And Sagualuza represents himself as merely a link in a chain of both fictional and real writers and readers, visual and moving image artists, the combination of whom puts into question the notion of the author as individual, non-origin of his own writing. And I'll come back to this point, and if not, uh, you can ask me in, uh, during the questions. Um, perhaps more importantly, Agualuza suggests what Israeli philosopher and cultural critic Avishai Margalit describes in The Ethics of Memory as the obligation to remember by those sharing dense ties of family, friendship, or a common past, independently of whether or not they share the same nationality. And this is very important for Agualusa, as well as for the writers and artists who he mentions, not all Angolan by birth certificate. They are, however, Angolan as regards their potential belonging to an ethical community of memory in regard to the civil war that um, I described. Writing takes place in view of and towards the formation of such a community, reactualized in every act of reading due to the liter liter literariness of language, demanding that the reader become one more link in a continuous evocation, or better yet, convocation of why and what is there to mourn. Such a process is put into motion by the literary technique of mise en abîme, the text mirroring its own writing strategies, first of all performed in the foreword that I um, described, and second, at the level of the phoneme lu, recurring continually throughout the text, lending it historical, spatial, and argumentative coherence that literariness constructs memory and reminds one of the, and reminds the reader of the rhythms, the language of mourning, the ooh, deep, deep ooh, that if you read the text carefully as a poem, you will be able to, uh, to recognize, to identify. 
Um, I'm not going to go into all of this. Um, I'll try to be quick, um, and I can answer questions. Uh, but this is uh, all the many of the terms where the lu uh, um, appears in the book. A writer herself compelled to inscribe what she witnessed in the world outside her apartment in Rwanda, Ludo, the protagonist, is at the center of the concept of writing and by extension, reading as ludic but responsible activities. While not properly capturing a truth, writing constitutes the marks for someone else, a potential reader, to recollect or infer what the past was like at a given point in time from a specific, concrete bodily experience. In a fragmented way uh, that does not achieve some clarity until the final chapters, the lives of all other figures are shown to be connected to Ludo, a kind of metonymy of the history of Portuguese colonialism in Angola and its remnants and reminders in the post-independence period. Her nickname, nickname Ludo, in fact was given to her uh, by a brother-in-law, an engineer for Diamang. Diamang was the diamond was and continues to be the major diamond extraction company located in the province of Lunda, the uh, diamond rich uh, area of Angola and surrounding uh, countries. Uh, she, her name, acts as a reminder of a history of colonial violence that besieges the post-colonial present within a circle of violence promoted by uh, the cl clandestine traffic of raw diamonds reportedly exchanged by UNITA for armament and provisions to combat the MPLEA, and thanks to the support of the same countries that had supported the Luzu, or Portuguese, government in the founding of this diamond company in 1917. The phoneme Lu is also common to both luta and luto, that is, struggle and mourning inviting the reader to reflect upon the causality between the civil war, the struggle, and death, mourning. Put it differently, the motto generalized from the Mozambican anti-colonial struggle to a host of other struggles in Africa and beyond, and if you, and if you Google this, you will see how this motto is being used everywhere else. A luta continua, a vitória certa. Struggle continues, victory is certain, is appropriated by the muse of literariness in terms of a lutu, a mourning, that must be made and continue to be made in order for post-colonial hope to be regained. I will not read um, the last section. This is a good way to end. The idea is to regain that post-colonial hope that has been, the post-colonial hope that is the, the the struggle for independence, right? Had the hope of this country that was lost uh, with the Civil War. Thank you. Would you like to take a question or two now, or wait? I can take a question. If, um, if anyone has. Sometimes it's nice to, while it's fresh, to be able to ask one or two questions. If you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll bring your mic. We are taping, that's why we have to have this on mic. Hi, Ana Paula. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to put in a few like sentences or phrases exactly that criticism that you had of the lucifone term that you had alluded to. This might be anticipating the last section that you had, if you could condense it maybe. Um, if I can condense it now. Um, anyone who uses lucifone as a transparent, um, as, a, as an adjective that is neutral, that um, thinking that it is as neutral as saying francophone or hispanophone doesn't know history. Um, we cannot use an adjective that is the result of a, um, the founding of a community of lusophone speaking countries in 1994 at the same time that the European Union was paying Portugal to have 
the celebration of the so-called discoveries. The Lusophone community, which happens, which happens, which has yearly um, uh, meetings, there are journals, there's lots of money, lots of money, not just from Portugal, but from Brazil especially, because uh, there's more money there, to continue to have these celebrations and, and these defenses of Portuguese against the encroachment of French, especially English now, um, are liable, right? But we cannot simply use Lusophone without remembering that it is part and parcel of the celebrations for the so-called discoveries of the decade of the 90, um, and that it did not call for, that did not call for, nor initiate any, any type of remembrance. The men, the, the, the uh, leaders of each country came together in front of the monument to the discoveries in Lisbon and held hands and were uh, reconciled. And nothing was said about the violence of the war and the violence that followed the war, including um, um, that violence affecting all the Portuguese that, had, that were born in Angola and Mozambique and elsewhere and uh, found themselves without homes and having to flee and being called um, dirty co uh, pig colonists. People who today still don't have a home, even though they, um, you know, they work and they supposedly integrate it very well. So home here is something in the soul, much more so than a piece of land. Thank you. So now don't use Lusophone anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Our second speaker is Rahmi Dia Larasati, who is an associate professor and director of undergrad studies in gender, women, and sexuality studies. She's also a faculty advisor of the Inter Interdisciplinary Center for the Study of Global Change and a senior affiliate with a at Asian Lit Literatures, Cultures, and Media. Her book, The Dance That Makes You Vanish, Cultural Reconstruction in Post-Genocide Indonesia, uh, was published by University of Press in 2013 and theorized cultural reconstruction and embodiment of memory after genocide. Her new book project, Dancing in the Forest, Modern Machine and Audio Politics of Land Narrative, interrogates the aesthetic encounter between indigenous Indonesian voices and capitalist noise within globalized space. She speaks regularly in international fora, including um, keynote addresses in China in 2016, dancing the traces of empire between international and speaking of specificity, and in uh, Indonesia in this year, reviving culture for, culture for rural sustainability. Is it possible? Uh, she, her most notable creative work is Missing, which was in Kuala Lumpur in 2018, also Archive 2 in Melbourne in 2018, and Lament and Archive 1 in Canberra in 2018. In, at the University of Minnesota, she has, uh, uh, she constructed Talk to the Wall at University of Minnesota in 2008. Please welcome Rahmi Dia Larasati. Prelude, prelude, judge Covenant sided with Exxon Mobil against villager who suffered torture in Aceh, Indonesia. Second, it is regrettable that the state of Indonesia did not accept the invitation to participate in the hearing of make submission to the International People Tribunal in Netherlands. The government of the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia 
also did not accept the invitation extended by the tribunal. The judges welcomed the willingness of individual members of Indonesian National Human Rights Commission, Komnas HAM, and the National Commission on Violence Against Women, Komnas Perempuan, to brief the tribunal. Third, Ratna Sarumpait, 2018, a self-claimed feminist theater study scholar and post-colonial theater practitioner has been arrested in Jakarta airport on the way to Chile for Women Writer and International Conference. Ratna Sarumpet is also a spoken person for Gerindra Political Party, I argue, a fascist and conservative, a son of La Suharto, the longest dictator of Indonesia New Order after US support genocide in 1965 and 66. Those are my introduction. Thank you for the committee to include me in this special celebration for 150 years of CLA. This year mark my 11 years <laughs> present at the University of Minnesota. It seemed only yesterday I landed to a snowy storm at early October after waiting for my visa approval in 2007. And it was a real deal, first snow experience. At this past 11 years, I cannot call myself as an expert of spatial bodily negotiation with the issue of snow. <laughs> but at least, slowly register of the familiarity to bridge my longing to this snowy, to a created a notion of a home. As Annie Fadiman mentioned in her ethnographic on cultural collision, her mom, child, and an American doctor, with no intention to look at the particularity of historicity of my arrival as a form of essentialism and ethno-nationalism and distinct particular agreement of US and those places outside there that historically collaborate in their US military intervention, I still argue that the desire of postcoloniality as methodology and looking at this framing so-called human right, and as Gayatri Spivak called the complicitness and the complicated metropole identity formation, and Marta Savigliano call it, renamed the journey as a scandalizing national identity, then the issue of human right as a discourse, as a field of study, and also as a reference on many international relations are real deal. We are familiar with the term of democratization, I put it in a quote, woman empowerment, I put it in a quote, and human right intervention, and all of that as a mechanism of post-war conversation, policy, and financial attachment. This question that I just mentioned and the list that I just uh, also mentioned and looking back to my role in rethinking on how university and its knowledge college liberal art production is also become a tool to engage to broader urgent conversation which is not single methodology will be enough as we also remember the historicity of its genre that somehow let's say compare with literature how human right itself as a field closer to the state discourse therefore how then the post-colonial the positionality of postcolonial scholar in looking at the question of human right as a form of engagement with care, but also as a critical consciousness in respond to dialectic temporality, a place, a knowledge, a body, a different racial tension, gender politic in this conversation. Today, I prioritize my attention to this relation. Actually, I was prepared completely different paper, but I came to 
many different talk that has been done during this event and yesterday and the opening. So I do not want to be redundant. This is precious space and I want to honor your presence here. So that's why last night I got crazy and I changed. I want to talk about this. So anyway, that's my warning. So today I prioritize my attention to this relation and which gave me an inspiration to enter the team that the organizer suggested to this panel. For some of us, the everyday creation is negotiation and negation of how diaspora location bridge our own historicity of complicitness and its arrival where the place and its space provide the possibility, seduction of promise, but also consistently as a form of reminder, the relationality of violence that often we try to escape, but also pondering at our new creation, the question of home and productivity. Therefore, here, it is very clear, I engage with the issue of postcolonial as a form of methodology of thought, rather mapping precise time when the colonizer withdraw from their desire in colonizing, because it's never done. They never withdraw. They're just renaming it. And also political historiography and its positionality where independent of a country, of a state, is not necessary creation of identity and living condition that somehow suddenly a separation. Without forgetting or diminishing the many other scholars who already thinking and framing the term decolonialism, decolonization and also the one who engage in their daily moving through public space and reconfiguration of survival, not only as a form of engagement with discourse, but precisely the living bodily experience of colonial relation and gender racialization, I also share the hen, my own locality, where it is, as Anzal Jua calling it, the critical consciousness provides as an urge for not being stuck, stay at the place, but moving. And that moving I capture as, a, as I am dancer. Moving as I capture as a kind of language and its conversation that somehow require the form of persistent what has been done in the idea of memory and body. This particular thinking of human right then, many have argued, is a problem we face that has always located two places where the colonial imagine has left, but as we know, they never left, as something completely a predicament of time that is not true, yet often exists, particularly as a form of critique to the post-colonial take as methodology of thought and circulation of knowledge production. Yet I argue precisely the reaffirmation of racialization in a different form and the value of the diaspora as a possible mode of speaking, as I gave you example about Ratna Sarumpet, about um, international people tribunal that happen and possible only in Netherlands in which we know it was colonized Indonesia for such long time, and then suddenly awakening of Netherlands to be the center of international people tribunal in which they dedicate to examine specifically the violence of the savage man of Indonesia. So in this context, I argue precisely, again, the reaffirmation of the racialization in different form and the value of the diaspora, the value of the diaspora, as mentioned in the People Tribunal, many of the document and many of the um, memoir was provided by the Indonesian exile at the as the speciality, speciality of knowledge that speak in between, create tension between two homes. Therefore, I propose to take back the idea of memory as a bodily archive through a different temporal and spatial consciousness, which I will locate in the body and embodied 
in this context, dance technique as an example, as a different kind of materialist epistemology that somehow has been displaced through the ex exoticism language of aesthetic and the glamorization that often happen on behalf of new kind of universalism in thinking of human rights. This idea engages with the study of the aesthetic as my second door to enter this conversation, as an embodied form and over a critic of the study of value and commodification that emerged in the global spatial imagination. I explore many examples, the neglected interrelationship between cultural spatial reconstruction and in the context of Indonesia, the question of land ownership as a sign of livelihood by way of critique of development and through an investigation of the multiple traces of colonialism. First, land is taken from communities to be used for state trade and corporate industrialization. Then the aesthetic act of resistance and remembrance by the member of the community who own the land via artistic production and protest are not only lost that particular spatial living place, but commoditize the aesthetic itself, the, the art itself, through different kind of temporality value of tourist attraction. And worse, in some places, as a form of citizen obligation informing pledge in nationalism, and as a result, the global space create rescue as a mode of operation through this cost of the human right and a global cultural exchange. And therefore, this machine analyzed through language of new discourse, veticism of the indigenous, and by corporation as a form of corporate cultural responsibility, rather the extensive analysis and the reflective critical consciousness, what is the violence that has been done? And then we move away looking at how then the aesthetic production to reflect this kind of tension. This new method of capitalist inclusion of the survivor in a globalized project of aestheticizing space is a neoliberal tactic in which the commoditized reference of the aesthetic creation of the marginalized is not, in fact, a sign of inclusion, but rather of further displacement of violence narrative. Artistic project within this schema may also be used as an act of resistance if, after become a world art or globalized art, there is a way to return home especially after the political economy gave a hint, the creation, how the globalized space can assure or curatorial that particular moment of aesthetic expression. Gaia Disprefak is a one of a uh, pioneer in literature that so-called and claim as a post-colonial thought, suggests that aesthetic creation as a form of translation in the circulation on the global spaces, only possible through education. So there is turning point of the action, and this is why college liberal art is important in this machine. Intended as a mean, that at the beginning, the collecting, intended as a mean of colonial archiving, that might bring critical consciousness into paradigm of globalization and to its attention. And that is where actually we, the diaspora, playfully, complicitly play with it, that possibility. Although we are aware many of them are fraught, fail, but also there is a hope. Within this currency of global attention, traces of possible mobility through the economic of translation for those artistic practices influence mode of speech and creation. And yet the result of this attention, again, render to the sublime of the aesthetic. So often move away from the urgency, the agenda why the speaking need to be done. 
In reading the aesthetic accumulation in global space as a form of conversation between human right and post-colonial location and its practice as a methodology for examining cultural representation, I therefore argue dialectic of remembering as a form of memory. To support my view on this, allow me to use my study to revisit the mapping, the charge of cultural accumulation. I would like to give you an example. Allow me to dance. <laughs> so just imagine, this is what Spiva argued, right? imagination and translation. <coughs> we are in the middle of forest. I cannot, let's see. We're taping, so. Yes, so just imagine as Gayatri Spivak invite us to think a forest. There is a goddess called Devi, yes? Devi is dancing, entering the forest. This is a very interesting dancing and holding the microphone, yeah? This one. Yeah? Many of it come to each of you in a different understanding. One, what they are doing? The other, oh, is this the concept of goddess of Devi in the context of Sprifat? Or is it about journey? Right, so a lot of those moments of translation arrive in us, you as an audience. And this is precisely a playful engagement or invitation where the idea of critical consciousness located in our imagination, how we play with it, how we do with it. And in this context, precisely also the place where the fraud and the failure happen. So this dialectic of translation of aesthetic as a discussion of Daffy, who supposedly a literature about consciousness of gender politics, within certain tradition is not necessarily translated in the same mode of aesthetic what rely on global uh, education could provide. This is precisely my argument. Thank you. Great. Um, wh why don't we field one or two questions? Um, first of all, I want to thank you for this amazing presentation. I think it made me think a, a lot about my own research. And my question is about time. And um, what you mentioned since the beginning about how post-colonial is a methodology. But um, I have heard many critiques about how the, this idea of post, post something, relates something that has been done, has been fixed. Um, in this case, also human rights has been criticized as something that says, you know, the crimes happened in the past, we gotta move forward. In this politic, uh, politics of translation, also the, it's interesting that you mentioned the dialectics in the sense that how do you think like the body or like this performance of the body makes make us think about time in the sense that it's, it's something that I experienced before. For instance, when you were giving this uh, dancing, it's like, well, it's maybe something that relates to the past and the present. It's something that the past doesn't exist and we just forget about what happened before and then think about the future. So it, it, it's like this tension sometimes about thinking between different experiences in only one performance in the present. So I, I don't know if I'm making myself uh, I mean, explain, but I think uh, that is one of the, of the issues when we try to criticize about like, how human rights present this motto, present, past, and future. So I just wanna. Oh. Um, oh, this one? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I might give you example like this. So let's say,
This is a, one of the famous technique of Apsara from Cambodian dance. But pay attention, when the Cambodian dancer perform, there is a knowledge already being placed. This art form, this technique is a mode of speaking as the survivor of genocide. Because the narrative of genocide in Cambodia was already in the global space of production because precisely related with the state discourse, especially United States or French, that they really want to argue how genocide has been done in the context of Cambodia. So the, the text already distributed, right? The body who carried this technique it doesn't matter the princess, the daughter of the king, who's actually even never see the, maybe never see the violence outside the palace, or she was suddenly being exiled in China and France, is automatic connected in that kind of identity location that already has been kept. However, where the body is, some of the body that as a form of memory of training related with certain genealogy, not necessarily being accepted as an aesthetic of speaking. Let's say we talk about Native American in the US or some places that the body already considered unwanted by their state in the connection with US policy. So I mentioned uh, International People Tribunal, where the genocide itself was strongly supported by the US from the Cold War policy. So those unwanted body that being killed there, it's not necessary when they perform, carry that particular mode of translation of survival. This is precisely where the dialectic mean how we read this body as a form of seduction, but at the same time, it's a personal engagement call who done this movement and function as a speaking of what. And that's precisely the homework of the aesthetic production. That's why this movement could be two things. One, fall on the idea of racism and exoticism in which is, we already know the thing, but in the context of human rights, it's the persistent the locality of uniqueness as a form of diaspora uh, engagement to the globalized space, but at the same time, it's also a call to engage and disengage and to talk about it in a way that undo the process of universalism, universalizing. So that's why I call it. The demands of dancing with a microphone are <laughs> something we should consider. Um, thank you. Our third speaker is Patrick McNamara, and he will be speaking on fragmented memories, trauma, survival, and historical disassociation. Patrick received his PhD in Latin American history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and began teaching in 1999 at that time at the University of Minnesota. He is currently an associate professor of history with academic affiliations in the departments of Spanish and Portuguese and American studies and the program, the human rights program. In 2008, he began to conduct research on drug-related violence in Mexico and Central America, and he continues to focus on this topic, particularly in regards to El Salvador. Please join me in welcoming Patrick McNamara. Well, I always feel at home at the McNamara Alumni Center. <laughs> and um, I... Um, I, I offered a brief introduction to uh, Barb. I would just add that um, I'm combining today work that I do as a historian, and I'm writing a book that's tentatively called A Brief History of Memory that looks at the study of memory from different disciplines over the past 
well, maybe, maybe 150 years, it's more like 140. Um, and it deals in part with the 323 different terms I've identified uh, that people use to talk about memory, um, the fragmentation of memory studies, and the singular way in which we talk about history as a, a, um, only one term, really, to describe the past. Um, I'm struck today as well by the different sort of subtitles for our uh, meetings this week. Um, the 150th anniversary suggests reflection on the past, uh, shattering expectations. I'm a little worried that Jaron Form suggests that maybe this is what I'm supposed to be doing now, or um, I'm not quite sure exactly. But the subtitle for um, the overall conference is looking forward faculty perspectives on the future of CLA. And so in some ways, my talk will address that as well as this work I'm doing on El Salvador. The study of memory has a long history at the University of Minnesota. George Edgar Vincent, who became the third president of our university from 1911 to 1917, first wrote about what he called social memory and collective memory in 1896. At that time, he was a newly minted PhD in sociology at the University of Chicago. And like most sociologists of his era, <clears throat> Vincent argued that individuals formed social groups, a view that was displaced then within the field of sociology by Emil Durkheim's emphasis on social groups themselves. And within memory studies, Durkheim's former student, Maurice Holbach's, of course, is recognized as what um, Jeffrey Olcott calls the father of social memory, even though Halvach's book was not published until 1925 and only partially translated into English in 1992. Vincent's move into administration, first as the Dean of Arts, Science, and Literature at the University of Chicago, as president of the University of Minnesota, and then as president of the Rockefeller Foundation, where he shifted that organization's financial support toward social science research, uh, essentially, and perhaps not surprisingly, brought an end to his publishing career. But his earlier work deserves more serious, if just brief, consideration. He saw higher education, and adult education for that matter. Um, in fact, he began the program that uh, eventually uh, created the College of Continuing, Edge at the, uh, of Continuing Education at the University of Minnesota. But higher education was the means, he argued, of overcoming divisions within society. He asked, if the accumulation of experiences are divided among social groups, must not consciousness and self-consciousness, which depend upon memory, be equally fragmented? Thus, history and memory are crucial for maintaining social cohesion, he argued, quote, without an ever alert sense of the past and its significance, a people cannot maintain its solidarity and translate the experience of yesterday into the purposes of tomorrow, end quote. Of course, a post-colonial perspective would ask whose memory and whose history is being forgotten and whose version of the past is being so often imposed on marginal social groups. I mentioned Vincent's concerns about social conflict and cohesion in part because I've been studying a society that has experienced violent divisions and fragmentation for the past two generations. El Salvador was torn by civil war <clears throat> from 1980 to 92, and for the past two decades, the people of El Salvador have endured unimaginable violent fragmentation caused by criminal gangs fighting against the government. The series of governments in El Salvador have been unable, and I would say unwilling, to curb violence, and thousands of civilians have been forced to flee for their lives by seeking asylum in the United States. And for the past four years, I've tried to explain to immigration judges and homeland security lawyers the historical origins of the current violence and to explain the trauma people have experienced that brought them to the United States. These explanations must be made for individual cases, 
even though the stories begin to repeat themselves over and over again. There was a wave of violence washing over El Salvador and other parts of Central America, and yet asylum applications, applicants are required to talk in terms of individual experiences and individual memories of loved ones killed or disappeared, of women and girls as young as 12, beat up by domestic partners and raped by family members or gang members, and of the frustration and fear of realizing that the police will not protect you and that your only chance of surviving is to flee. All of these thousands of individuals who have fled their homes have experienced trauma. And all of them who seek asylum must find the words to explain that trauma in formal court proceedings that demand precise names and dates and locations. I've listened to judges and Homeland Security attorneys interrogate asylum applicants about small inconsistencies, apparent contradictions, and gaps in memory. And I've listened to men and women re-experience that trauma as they recount horrific acts committed against them or a loved one, using only short phrases and sentences so the translator can keep up with the story. As these people sit and wait for the okay to continue, their pain rises to the surface as they anticipate what to say next, how to be believable, and how to put into words acts of violence stored in their bodies and memories that they have tried to forget in order to survive. I have to admit that I used to be frustrated sometimes as well. Written declarations are often incomplete. The interviews with victims of violence that I've had in El Salvador and here are often agonizingly slow and chronologies inconsistent. People hold back information, but um, I wanna tell them now is the time to share everything. Trust me. But they don't know who I am or what I'll do with their story. I used to think that this narrative practiced that I have seen so often was something they had learned culturally, an intentional effort to conceal or confuse people in official capacities because of mistrust. And indeed, for two generations, revealing too much about yourself and your story could get you killed. Of course, we know now that traumatic experiences create fragmented memories, that cortisol, the stress hormone, combines with the neurotransmitter epipenephrine to, disrupt, to do, uh, disrupt memory consolidation. Structural elements of the memory are missing due to dissociation, irregular encoding, and data-driven focus that interferes with emotional tagging. No wonder the mother from El Salvador who walked into her house to see a gang member pants around his ankles raping her 13-year-old daughter testify that she could not remember all of the details. Or the father who focused uh, details on where he lived in terms of where gang members had beat him up. He fled and afterwards, after he arrived in the United States, gang members came back to his house where they raped and then killed his wife. And now he felt responsible for that. But the judge and the attorney repeatedly questioned him about where exactly did you live? And how come it seems as if you're changing these locations in different testimony? Or even the woman whose husband abused her for years. He was a policeman and protected by his fellow officers. And her veracity was called into question when she provided new information after receiving therapy uh, in the United States about what he had done to her. The judge was asked to consider whether or not she was telling the whole truth. Uh, psychogenic amnesia, as defined in the DSM-5, explains memory gaps, an inability to recall personal information, usually of a traumatic or stressful nature. Historical dissociation, I would argue, is a detachment from reality for individuals and especially for groups. U.S. policymakers are detached from this history when they ignore the role in the Civil War, the deportation of 45,000 gang felons from the U.S. in the 1990s, and the violation of human rights agreements 
when they criminalize refugees from El Salvador and take away their children. Psychologists Daniel Gilbert and Timothy Wilson have argued that time shapes all sentient life. They say, all animals are on a voyage through time, navigating towards futures that promote their survival and away from futures that threaten it. Pleasure and pain are the stars about which they steer. Still, Gilbert and Wilson argue that humans are the only species who can create a prescription of the future, an imagined representation of how the future might unfold based primarily on previous experiences. The bulk of their work demonstrates that humans are poor forecasters, that their projections of the future are most often incorrect. In a separate essay, they argue that organisms remember the past so they can predict the future. Thus, for humans to imagine the future more accurately, we're fully dependent on learning from that experience. And for that reason, I want to propose a friendly amendment to um, their claim about the unique human ability to think of the future. Humans are also the only species who ruminate or study the past. Other animals learn from previous experiences and modify their behavior, uh, but they do not create a record of the past, a history that provides an interpretation of previous experiences that might guide an individual or a group into the future. As noted above, the future for an individual or a social group is tied directly to experiences and knowledge of the past. For that reason, people interested in creating new technologies, new business models, new art forms, or new college priorities and programs should develop the skills to learn from the past because these would be the skills that provide the best and most helpful practice to more thoroughly anticipate the future. Today, it seems we're living in an unending present defined by rapid technological change with only superficial implications. We are behind if we ignore the newest device, the most recent meme, or the latest news about popular culture or political events. This rush to stay connected to current preoccupations distorts our perspective of time and our interest in change over time, the primary subject of historical inquiry. A search for instant information gratification has become a form of digital solipsism, the self-centered epistemological trap that certain or true knowledge exists only in the, individual, in the individual's mind and comes from the individual's experiences. One of the problems of our present time is that the past appears irrelevant in a world where too many people seek constantly current knowledge and experience. And I wrote in the margins, um, Twitter seems to contribute, I think, to this obsession with the present moment, although I'm not a Twitter user, so I don't really know. I'm, it seems that way to me as an observer of Twitter, I guess. Uh, but in fact, this search uh, for constantly current information is more likely to lead to frustration and disorientation, since something only outside of time could be constantly current and always new. It is simply impossible for humans to live in the present, the evolution, or permanently in the present. The evolution of our brains to think in terms of time scales began millions of years ago and it seems unlikely we will ever return to a state of unconscious temporal existence. Luckily, we would not be capable of realizing what we had lost if it were to happen. For now, I believe the most effective way to escape the myopia of the present is to foster historical consciousness. I'm confident that we'll have better futures if we spend more time in the present studying the past. And on this point, I'm not alone. Uh, in 1881, psychologist Theodore Rubo claimed, our knowledge of the future can only be a copy of the past. Henri Bergson said in 1896, it may be said that we have no grasp of the future without an equal and corresponding outlook over the past. University of Minnesota anthropologist W.D. Wallace expressed this idea more succinctly. He said in 1920, promises of the future lie in the past. 
And similarly, historian Michel de Certeau said in 1975, history is always ambivalent. The locus that it carves for the past is equal a fashion of making a place for the future. And semiotician and novelist Umberto Eco wrote in 1904, I think our lives are like that. You can only anticipate the future if you can call the past to mind. So returning in conclusion to uh, George Vincent, um, I want to uh, acknowledge that memory studies at the University of Minnesota and around the world has certainly gone much further than he first anticipated when he began writing about social memory and collective memory. Today, interdisciplinary work drawing from the humanities, cognitive psychology, and neuroscience points in new directions. And yet, the contributions made over time to the work of memory um, and how especially that work and those memories influence human rights protection is something that continues today. I think we must challenge expectations that court proceedings demand unambiguous, consistent memories from trauma survivors. And we must try to overcome historical dissociation that considers the past over and done, that there is no way to accurately know what happened five years ago or 35 years ago or 50 years ago or even 150 years ago when the College of Liberal Arts began. Thank you. Yeah. Shall we sit in order? Uh, it doesn't matter. Right? Historical order. Yeah, Historical. Exactly. <laughs> we won't start talking about the oldest to the youngest. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'd just like to begin by thanking each of you for really remarkable presentations that um, feel like they're definitely looking through different lenses, but at a lot of the same themes. Um, so maybe i take the privilege of the chair just to start the conversation and then um, open it to the audience for your questions for the, the panelists, either individually or collectively. Um, I'm struck by the, this, the relationship really between truth and memory that has been raised in each of your presentations. Um, we live in an era where the, the truth is malleable, manipulable, and um, Patrick points out the failure of individual memory. It's just a part of who we are, that, that individuals are notoriously bad at, at truthful memories. Um, but even collective memories, it feels like are um, manipulatable these days, and we've certainly, we see that if in the post-colonial context, where e either side of the colonial discussion um, has its accepted collective memory, and sometimes that those memories are weaponized against other, other groups that are deemed not worthy to, to participate in the memory discussion. So um, I'm wondering if you could just each Talk about that, and, and I also want to put a, a, a shade on this, this reflection of thinking about, since we are in the College of Liberal Arts, thinking about the role of education and, and how, not just formal education, but the, the passing, you know, how, um, how do we see memories uh, of, of past, past and of past atrocities being um, passed on in ways that can actually promote or protect human rights or prevent further atrocities of, of the nature that w we've seen so much. So those are just some, some thoughts. Um, you're, you're welcome to go in whatever direction you want. Um, Patrick, I'm gonna invite you to start since you didn't get to, and we'll go, we'll go backwards. Well, I was thinking, um, we were invited, the, the panel, to, to consider how post-colonial studies has 
uh, inform the way we understand memory and, and history. Um, and I guess I should have um, acknowledged that at least where, where I'm where I'm moving is towards an idea that would be post post colonial studies or after colonial studies, and and that's suggesting that that humans have all humans have uh, a, the same kind of cognitive processes involved in memory formation, and while it might while I I acknowledge that I thought that this was a Salvadoran way of cultural storytelling, that seemed to make sense for political, historical reasons, that what they're dealing with is trauma. That's a much broader experience. Um, and I think, um, well, I, I think we, even though we're described, we're being described as post-colonial, we, we can also begin to reach out beyond that paradigm. Um, in terms of, of passing on knowledge of past atrocities, I'm struck at all of the, um, at the lack of real historical reflection when I'm in El Salvador. And in part, that comes from an urgency, I think, of the everyday. Um, and my, my own work has shifted in that regard. Um, I was in uh, Morelia, Michoacan in 2008 for a history conference when a uh, drug cartel exploded bombs in a plaza where people were gathering for independence celebrations. And the violence had started two years earlier, the mass violence. But suddenly I realized that I should probably set aside Porfirio Diaz in the 19th century because something more urgent is going on and I needed to pay attention to that. So um, that's when um, I felt that I could shift my, my focus. And the College of Liberal Arts really gives me that, um, that sort of uh, freedom or, or opportunity to follow my own interests. And uh, even though I still teach history, I'm very much tied to what's going on. Um, so I guess I'll stop there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very difficult question. Number one, I believe postcolonial, as I suggest in my presentation, is for me, I look at that as a methodology rather than it's a time frame in the sense that um, the engagement of how we look at, at colonial historicity and what has been left, what has been done, when the colonial left, if we are talking about the actual colonial history in the sense of traditional looking of, of uh, history, um, there is a new creation of dependency complex. Let's say the, birth, the history of the birth of IMF and World Bank, right? So um, we create, we we create that mode of dependency complex from certain places, always relate back to the metropole where actually was done the violence itself. So here I see the postcolonial could be more useful if we look at that term as a, as a more as a form of methodology. So the question of truth here is a constant uh, investigation what could be happen or what is possible in negating this kind of conversation between uh, places as we have learned the independence of a state, of a country, not guarantee of that non-dependency complex because this creation of circle um, uh, connectivity. Um, the second part that I would like to address in this response is the, the question of truth and the vulnerability of memory, um, each individual or collective. Um, I don't know how to answer that. It's a very, uh, it's a very, um, it's required time for me to understand the question because if I, if I say that we agree individual memory has that sense of vulnerability and failure, then um, there is no possible way to locate uh, the question of access to 
uh, justice system. Um, and that's precisely related, let's say, with, with the court system. Um, yeah, I don't know how to answer that. Okay. Yeah, um, in Indonesia, the collective is the dominant. Mm -hmm. And the personal memory or engagement to what has been done become a form of, of um, um, a memory that um, unwanted. Therefore, this persistent locating collective and individual is dangerous tarp, trap. Mm -hmm. Right, in part, <clears throat> I was thinking about the role of audience in, yeah. in uh, the kinds of memory production that you're talking about. It's very, yeah. very specific. Um, I'm, I'm a lawyer, come from the more yes. uh, un understand, but the, the need for um, Mem truth as proof or, yeah. or memory as, as proof yeah. and how, um, uh, how that shapes the, the performance of, yeah. of that. And, and so in some ways, it, it, I think that it's, I'm trying to think through that, that, that how, how different audiences affect mm -hmm. um, the ability to perform memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. yeah. So in the case of Indonesia, so far, I mean, the murderer, the killer, still in power. So it's different case with Rwanda, for example, where th there is a possibility of conversation. But when the actual um, perpetrator still in the dominant sphere of pro knowledge production, and that is where actually the personal memory and the integration of this kind of thinking, it requires time how to place it. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Yeah. In the process of truth and reconciliation, for example. That's why in Indonesia never happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other problem? Um, Speaking from the perspective of uh, someone who teaches literature, I'd like to answer, start answering your question by, um, by evoking uh, the responsibility that we should have in departments of literature mm -hmm. with the past. Um, and that responsibility um, has been uh, lost um, in the last, uh, I would say, uh, maybe my generation, um, moving away from requiring students mm -hmm. to take um, courses in history mm -hmm. and to take courses that uh, deal with periods of history, uh, in this case, um, the many truths um, uh, that uh, a literary period can provide. That is not the literary period that a student wants to focus on, mm. which tends to be, and, and, and rightly so, if, if you become a specialist, um, uh, very focused. I think that one of the ways in which, the primary way in which we can um, foster historical consciousness to pick up um, on uh, a very beautiful phrase that Pat um, just enunciated, is uh, to foster in our students mm -hmm. that consciousness. And we can only do so by um, certainly the readings we do um, and model for them, um, but also in our programs um, of study. Um, I think that I'm, I'm reminded um, that um, within, for example, uh, Latin American uh, studies and, and beyond, the paradigm of um, coloniality um, is, um, has been around the theoretical paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, it is not enough to repeat what um, mm -hmm. Dussel, uh, or others say about that paradigm. We need to know what it means mm -hmm. that, uh, that race and class in a certain uh, perspective of gender mm -hmm. um, and sexuality structured um, the colonial world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that only by going to those texts, to the truths 
um, or untruths, since they are fiction, that are available to us, can we glean a little bit um, of what that coloniality is? Mm -hmm. um, so um, I do think that in departments of literature, we have a very, very important role to play in fostering historical consciousness. Can I um, make this into a round table? Like we yeah. Because responding to that, I just want to, uh, two of your graduate students, are, um, Olga and, and Colin, are doing an independent study with me on Mexican literature and history. And, but they sought me out. Yeah. And I, I think it's even, what you're talking about is an issue that goes beyond the departmental level, and we really have an opportunity to address this at the collegiate level, because mm -hmm. the program, in, the graduate program in history has been cut in half. And I think pretty much the same for Spanish and Portuguese. So that I used to, when I started, there were students who would, who would take seminars with me from, from that department regularly. And, um, and then US history students would take my seminars as well. But now with these small numbers, we don't get enough to really teach a seminar anymore. And we do independent studies. But I am essentially doing it as an overload. Um, uh, and it's become more like, a, a, I guess, an Oxford style kind of tutorial, which will work. It will work really well, I think. And I'm getting to know um, these two students really well. But I'm, I really don't want to teach five classes a year <laughs> and, and get research done and do community service like I'm doing um, with the asylum community. But that's a collegiate question, and um, we'll have, I think, is there a spokesperson for the college here? <laughs> you were. I think we're in no. the college. We won't load I was it never there. good at <laughs> speaking. <laughs> well, I'd like to open the discussion up to the audience. You've been faithful, faithful audience in this memory discussion. Maybe we could take two or three questions and then have a round. So the man with the microphone is in the, in the back, so please raise your hand. Hi, yeah, I have two questions. Um, the first is for Ana Paula. You said in the opening to your, to your presentation that you're discussing literature in situations where governments have not confronted the atrocities that have occurred. And I'm just curious, due to my research, if you could speak a little bit to how you see literature's role changing in governments that have confronted atrocities. But where does literature play a role in those types of governments? And then I have a second question um, about dance, more particularly, because it, it was really interesting to me, this idea of the dialectics of translation, of how different people understand dance movements. Um, and I did dance for a long time, and so I guess my question is, where does the choreographer of a dance play a role in that in trying to communicate or trying to shape how an audience might read a specific translation? Great. Is there another question? Yes. Or, yes, go ahead. Um, my question is directed towards uh, Professor McNamara. So, uh, <laughs> A little nervous. Okay, so um, I know this might not be your area, your region of study, but um, recently, yeah, uh, your Europe has been very like center left in their politics, and recently they've been moving more towards um, uh, populist and authoritative um, parties. So, like for example, uh, in Sweden, they just recently uh, gave a platform to a party with neo-Nazi roots, and this is really uh, difficult to, to understand because Sweden is known as a socially democratic, uh, socially democratic nation. So um, what I'm trying to ask is, as these, uh, as these survivors and witnesses, um, as those generations of survivors and witnesses pass away from World War II, um, do you think it's inevitable that people are going to forget the past and this will lead to another war, essentially? Or are there enough sanctions put in place that nothing like to that level will happen again? Thanks. Well, let's go with that round of questions, since there was one for each. Ana Paula, how about if you start? Okay. 
Um, I, um, I think that in uh, governments um, where there are truth commissions or uh, have taken a step towards um, an institutionalized um, truth and uh, truth finding and, and, um, and um, memories that um, were uh, not, uh, were, were suppressed. I think that um, the role of literature there um, has to be more than anything else educating um, the young. In Brazil, for example, um, there, is, um, there are exams of entry uh, into the universities. And um, there is the practice of, uh, I don't know if it's every year, but regularly, posting the lists of books that students must read, must be, are examined on uh, when they apply for the university. Um, just as um, black Brazilian literature is now a part um, of those reading lists, it is very, very important that um, accounts, literary accounts, for example, of the, of the dictatorship, of the violence um, that went on in the dictatorship, and not just uh, from one uh, perspective, uh, become part of those, uh, of those lists that are supposed to form the Brazilian citizen. So that's, that may be very reduced, but we do have to ask ourselves, um, really, what can literature do in countries where illiteracy is still a major issue? And, and within the countries, I'm thinking about pockets, mm -hmm. right? Where illiteracy is an issue, and, if, uh, and people need to eat before they need, before they um, buy books or read books. So I don't think that uh, we need to be, you know, we can be so idealistic, but at least make those narratives part of what um, is supposed to constitute the overall formation, um, uh, cultural formation of the citizen. Thank you. So the question was about role of choreographer. So my work dedicated to um, a places where the mode of translation somehow being placed require or obligate to engage in the global space. Mm -hmm. um, precisely that is a, a, a mode of operation. And I'm looking at places where the colonial trajectory reformulate through different kind of language. Uh, in relationality. Um, so in this kind of places where the mode of translation require because of racial or nation or identity politic that cannot be interpreted a rifle of the body or the work itself, suddenly look at as a form of individual innovation as we very aware that most work in the United States or in Europe, let's say, when the choreographer create a work, suddenly uh, there is an expectation of locality where the notion of creation is rely of innovation as an individual. While in some other body, those choreographers are not uh, function like that because there is the burden of historicity, uh, especially related with um, you know, uh, racial uh, identification uh, of que and question of home. Right. Even though by default, some of them might be was born and grew up in the US. So in looking at this kind of role then, um, let's say there is a, uh, the idea of burden of translation. Um, and the danger part of it is, uh, let's, let's choose an example from Indonesia, let's say the access to global space from uh, 
choreographer that, let's say, well known in Indonesia, mediated through the linguists at this current time in this century uh, as a form of creative industry. So here we see the complication of um, um, and continuity how a choreography as a form of aesthetic engagement was already dictated through different kind of engagement what global space can provide. And those plays limit the idea of innovation where as a form of dialectic, I mentioned it's possible because number one is the tension, the pressure to engage the access of arrive even in the space at the states uh, through the language of creative industry from the third world places, even though we don't use that word anymore, but as a mode of operation function persistently. And then second, how then the knowledge of the burden of traditional dance technique mediate through the space, the global space, so that the audience engage through a layer of uh, uh, um, a door or element that how far and how far they can go. So this is, there is a different kind of a um, burden in this kind of role. And this is where precisely looking at the University of Minnesota, um, we see even the dance technique came from outside the US, we'll call world dance. And the technique is elective, non-major. Yeah. But the postmodern and the modern, even though we know the birth of modern dance was promoted by Ruth Sandenis, where precisely she studied during, after the culture exchange and during the World War, precisely study in Asia or other places. But when it arrived to certain body, so-called modern dance. This is precisely the politic of naming itself and how the role of choreographer, non-individual choreographer used to attach to this kind of quote-unquote post-colonial places because it's supposedly collective work, right? But now it's with the birth of the global space then you know, um, they also claim individual choreographer, and that is where actually the complication rises because different expectation and burden, especially aesthetic as a form of both sublime sources of erasure, but also creativity. Yeah. Wonderful, Patrick. Well, thank you for that question. The um, no. Uh, professional historian should ever acknowledge that anything is inevitable because if it were, there'd be no reason to have a department of history. Mm. Um, because we really emphasize more than anything that, that the, the past was, um, things happened in the past because the, the decisions and behavior of people and that there are always people resisting those um, kind of dominant decisions that are made about them and, and um, trying to change the outcome. But your question's a good one because I think what concerns me more is a little bit not uh, whether or not people forget the past, but that they fill their ideas of the past with this, what I'm calling historical dissociation, where they detach from uh, I guess, a reality of what actually happened. And there are all sorts of subtle ways for that to take place. Um, you mentioned World War II. Um, even, I think, the unanimous way in which people talked about the greatest generation, and they still are, um, detaches from the reality that, that that was also the generation of Jim Crow and Japanese American internment and the first and only episode of using atomic weapons. And so there's a, it, it's incomplete certainly to acknowledge um, or to, to give, to, to describe a group of people in that kind of singular way. Um, the, in terms of war, I think what we've also seen since World War II, that, that um, there actually have been very few conflicts that have been called wars. Most of the time now they're being called armed conflicts. And there are a whole series of 
um, the distinction is now whether they're internal armed conflicts or international or non-internal non-conflicts. And uh, there are also, though, more prevalent, I think, episodes of low intensity conflict or low intensity violence, I mean, mm -hmm. so that the, uh, the experiences of people fleeing gang violence is an act of violence. I mean, even the, the, the trip to get to the United States when families were blocked from entering ports of entry this summer and uh, after camping outside for a week or more, found another way into the United States, not through a port of entry, the Trump administration considered them criminals because they didn't request asylum at a port of entry. Um, but I think um, what, I also think though El Salvador is in some ways more of a vision of, a, of the future, which isn't a very promising future. Um, it seems in this globalized neoliberal world now, El Salvador has a lot that um, I think we might see, that we're beginning to even see in the United States, a kind of privatization of security, uh, an economy that's built around low wage assembly work or service work in uh, fast food um, restaurants and industrialized food production. Um, intense religiosity in terms of explaining why things happen, why people are killed is fulfilling some sort of uh, predetermined plan is, is a coping mechanism in El Salvador, but I see the same thing often in the United States for, um, of course, hurricanes and uh, things that are generated by global warming. And um, I, I think that what's, what I've noticed in El Salvador with six and a half million people, is, I'm afraid that that could be the future for many more people. Um, and last, I think I really like what uh, what we were just saying about the post-coloniality and um, the thinking globally, because a critique of post-colonial theory has been its uh, focus on the nation state. And I think an emerging realization among people working in human rights is that um, the international treaties that protect human rights are still in some ways dependent on nation state cooperation. And it's almost as if we figured out how to critique the nation state in the post-colonial world at a time when capitalism has shifted to something else and shifted to a much broader global model where uh, economic agreements are to determine our, who is prosperous and who is poor, but internal problems like uh, drug violence and gang violence are only the problems of a particular place like El Salvador or Mexico. And instead, policymakers in the United States detach themselves from the reality of mm -hmm. the drug demand in the US, of the demand for uh, cheap, cheap, cheaply per cheap um, underwear and t-shirts because Haynes is a huge factory in El Salvador, mm -hmm. or even if this is my favorite example of assembly plants. Uh, Costa Rica, um, the Rawlings factory there makes the two million baseballs used in Major League Baseball every year. And the workers are paid about 15 cents a ball for mostly hand stitching. And Major League sells, or small, or Rawlings sells them to the Major Leagues for $15 a piece. So everybody's excited to get a ball when you go to a baseball game. But there's a history to that commodity that has been um, separated from where the ball is used. So I say, I think I, th I see that more as a danger than, um, and I, I, I do see these groups you're talking about filling the historical dissociation with their own version, their false version, or in the case, I really quite obviously of President Trump of just lying. But that becomes a form of um, writing his own history as if, well, he, he, he doesn't even acknowledge what he said the day before, uh, much less what something might have happened before his lifetime. But very good question. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just wanted to comment that uh, in looking at the, the history of human rights, that, we, that I, I think that there has been um, a, a shift away from the triumphalist narrative, or we've tried to generate a shift away 
from the you know uh, World War II greatest generation um, and Eleanor Roosevelt you know representing the the best of the West and creating the these standards the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, not so much to claim that that those events did not occur but to um, try to understand what was going on the contextual um, situation that that l led to the creation of s advances in international law at the same time mm -hmm. as social and political disasters were taking place in in uh, particular states and uh, I think that that in terms of education is an important um, set of tensions that we can pass on in terms of thinking about memory and truth and human rights, that, that those, uh, those things did happen. We did create the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is a huge advance that has been a tool for people to, um, to empower themselves to create you know, their own stories and to advance their own stories and their own truths. But at the same time, we can't ignore the fact of, uh, you know, that it, of the lynchings that were happening in the United States or, as Patrick points out, the, the use of the first atomic weapon um, and the fact of the United States and the allied powers, powers' own um, war atrocities that get carried out in every armed conflict, both, si both sides of every armed conflict. Um, and so um, I think that the balance for me as a teacher is always to think about uh, complicating those stories, complicating that triumphalist narrative without paralyzing um, us from thinking that we can you know, make positive change in our own communities or, or the context in which we work. Uh, we can uh, tell truths through through literature, through the arts, through dance, through performance, uh, through storytelling, in ways that um, that uh, uh, that foreground the human dignity of of people who have been invisible up until now, and so um, so I think this has been a really wonderful uh, discussion of, of of just uh, some of the ways in which we we think about. Um, theoretical frames like post-colonialism, like human rights, um, like memory, and I, I'm really grateful to be a participant in this, and please join me in thanking these great panelists.